Good morning. It's my delight to share the Word of God with you this morning. And I am so glad that you've chosen to join us today. I want to speak to you for today and God's will in next week on from the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is tucked away in the Old Testament. Um, it's actually between the book of Ezra and the books of Esther. It's not a very well-known book, but it is a wonderful, wonderful book. And so I want to just share with you this morning. So I encourage you, if you have your Bible, to turn to the book of Nehemiah. It is the last of the historical books of the Old Testament. And um, we will look at verse, uh, we will look at chapter one today. So as you do so, let me take this time to lead us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your kindness and your, your grace toward us. Thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ who died to save us from our sins. Father, we thank you that it is through him that we have the power that we have the purpose for living. Lord, we ask you to speak to the hearts of all those who hear your word today. And Lord, may you take this word and let your name be glorified. Touch lives, encourage those who are discouraged, those who are going through a difficult time. Help them to know, oh God, that you are there. You are there to help us in our time of difficulties. We thank you so much, and we ask you, Spirit of God, to lead us through the word of God today. Speak to our hearts, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Chuck Swindoll is one of my favorite Bible teachers. He has written many books, and in one of his books, called The Quest for Character, he gives a very funny story. And that story is, um, it, it took place <laughs> several years ago. So let me just share it with you, the way he shared it in his book. He says, a funny thing happened in Darlington, Maryland, several years ago. Edith, a mother of eight, was coming home from a neighbor's house one Saturday afternoon. Things seemed too quiet as she walked across her front yard. Curious, she peered through the screen door and saw five of her youngest children huddled together, concentrating on something. So think about it. She's got eight kids, and she's out, and she just peers through the window, and she sees five of her kids huddled together in the living room, concentrating on something. So of course she's curious to know what they are concentrating on. So as she crept closer to them, trying to discover the center of attention, she could not believe her eyes. Smack dab in the middle of the circle were five of the cutest baby skunks. Edith screamed at the top of her voice. She shouted, quick, children, run. And of course, the kids got so scared, each one of the five children grabbed his skunk and ran. And the mother is just flabbergasted, seeing five of her children running with the skunk. She screamed out even louder. And each of the children holding that skunk squeezed their skunk. And as Chuck says, skunks do not like to be squeezed. And you can just imagine what happened from there. You know, for those of you I know, like those that are in the Caribbean, you may not be familiar with skunks. As far as I know, I don't think, at least in my country, we do not have skunks. But... I mean, the stench that comes from those little cute animals are just unbelievable. And what I could, cons uh, the closest thing that I can compare it to is rotten eggs. And uh, just imagine the mess 
that is in this lady's living room and the stench that is coming from there because of what her kids were engaged in. So today, I want to talk to you about a big mess that was going on in Israel. It is, it is shown to us, or we see, we read about it in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. These were dark days in the history of Israel. It was truly a social and political mess that was there. And so, if you were there with Nehemiah, seeing what he saw, you would probably ask the same, you would probably say the same thing that he said. As the report was brought to him, he most likely asked, he most likely said, look at the mess we are in. Look at the mess we are in. I want to talk to you today on the subject. Look at the mess we are in. You look at the world around us and we tell ourselves, look at the mess that we are in. You look at what is happening in the United States today and we say to ourselves, look at the mess that we are in. We look at the state of the church of Jesus Christ today and we exclaim, look at the mess that we are in. So today what I want to do is to paint a picture in your mind. I want to lay the foundation and show you what was going on in Israel in that day. They were in a mess. And Nehemiah occupying an important position in the kingdom of Persia comes to rescue his people and to restore things back to normalcy. And so I want to ask you if you would look with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. And as we read, let me hope that this picture can be painted in your mind. So here's what it says. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah, came and asked, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped the who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. Verse 3. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Look at verse 3. Very important. He asked them what was going on in the capital, Jerusalem, his city. And they said to him, The remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Look at his reaction, verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting before the God of heaven. No doubt, when they told him the situation in Jerusalem, he, what would came to his mind was, look at the mess that my people are in. Look at the mess that we are in. And so this morning, I want you to understand what was going on, the historical setting that led to pin the painting of the picture that Nehemiah had in his mind. 
So, number one, the setting of the distress. In verse 3, he says that the people that came to him and brought the report to him, he said, those that have came, those that have come back from the captivity, they are in great distress and trouble. He was saying that things are not good at home at all. He was saying that back in Jerusalem, things are a mess. And he was determined to allow God to use him so that he could restore Jerusalem. So let's look at the circumstances. Let's look at the setting. Let's look at the historical background. Think about this. The once great and united kingdom of the 12 tribes under King Saul and King David. When Solomon, after David died, Solomon came to the throne. During the days of King David, the children of Israel were at their height of prosperity. God had blessed King David. God had made him the most prosperous king, and after he died, his son Solomon continued his reign, and God blessed Solomon abundantly. But after the death of Solomon, the kingdom became divided. Ten tribes broke away and formed the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital in Samaria. Then the other two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, they became the southern kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. So first of all, I want you to see that the once great united kingdom of Israel became divided into two parts. But the situation gets even worse. In 722 BC, the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom and wiped them out from the books of history. So in 722, the Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom. So now that which is left is the southern kingdom of Judah. But the southern kingdom of Judah was about to meet its fate as well. In 606 BC and then in 597 BC and again in 586 BC, the Babylonians came under King Nebuchadnezzar. And as God had predicted, God had warned them that if they were to turn their backs on him, he would also turn his backs on them. He would also turn his back on them and allow foreign nations to take them into captivity. So sure enough, because of their sin, God allowed the Babylonians to take them into captivity. And for 70 years, they were captive in Babylon. God had warned them, and they had failed to obey God. And as a result, the judgment of God came down upon them. So there they are in Babylon for 70 years. You will recall in one of the Psalms, one of the Psalms says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wailed when we remembered Zion. They are there for 70 years. But God had promised that he would redeem them, that God had promised that he would deliver them from the hands of the Babylonians. So after 70 years, God raises up King Cyrus. The Babylonians have been taken over by the Persians. And so Cyrus is on the throne. And Cyrus allows the children of Israel to go back to their homeland. So here's what happens. The first, there's a first group that goes back to Jerusalem led by a guy named Zerubbabel. He takes a group back to Israel and they rebuild the temple. And then in 458, 
the Ezra the priest returns with another contingent and Ezra tries to restore the spiritual life of the people of God. And then finally in 445 BC, Nehemiah who was a layman, who was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, he goes back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. So that is the, the, the setting. They have turned their backs on God. God has allowed them to go into Babylonian captivity. They are there for 70 years, but God in the midst of his judgment, God is a God of grace and a God of mercy. And God speaks to Cyrus, and Cyrus allows the people of God to go back. So under Zerubbabel, the temple is rebuilt, but spiritual life is not restored. And so that is where the Bible tells us that when these guys came from Jerusalem to see Nehemiah, they asked him what was going, he asked them what was going on, and they said to him, I want you to understand that things are very bad back there in Jerusalem, the city of God, the hometown of Nehemiah. The gates have the, the walls have been broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. God's people are in distress. God's people are in reproach because they have turned their backs upon God. The setting. Secondly, I want you to see the source of the mess, the source of their distress. What it is that brought it upon them, and I have kind of hinted, uh, I have kind of hinted as to what was going on already. What it is that caused them to be in the mess that they are in, in the state that they are in. What's the cause of this? Number one, I want you to see it was a self-inflicted wound. It was a self-inflicted wound. I don't know if you have ever had that experience of you. Uh, trying to hammer something together, put in a structure together, and instead of hitting the hammer on the nail, you hit it on your hand, and it hurts so much. You hurt yourself. And that is exactly what the people of God did. They hurt themselves. It was a self-inflicted wound. In verse 6 of Nehemiah chapter 1, here is what scripture says. As Nehemiah cries out to God, as he prays to God, here's what he says to God. He says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. He says, I confess the sins of Israel we have sinned, including myself and my father's family, we have committed against you, Nehemiah says in chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed your commands, your decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. And Nehemiah is saying, What you see happening to us today is because we have been unfaithful to God. We have turned our backs on God. We have neglected God's word. We have neglected God's commandment. We have instead, we have chosen to live lives our own way, to live lives in total disregard to the Lord our God. In verse 9. He says, but if you return to me and obey my commands, then even you are exiled, the people are from the farthest horizon. I will gather them from there, bring them to the place I have chosen as my dwelling place for my name's sake. The mess that they were in, it was brought upon themselves. They were self-inflicted ones. 
They have chosen to turn away from God. There is a little saying that says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. I'm saying to you, my friend, you and I can choose to turn our backs upon God, but when we choose to turn our backs upon God, we do not have the freedom to choose the consequences, for scripture says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And I'm telling you today, that what you see happening to us, we are reaping exactly what we have sown. I am telling you today, the mess that the world is in, the mess that America is in, the mess that the church is in, it is all self-inflicted wounds because God says, if you are unfaithful to me, I will be unfaithful to you. So the source of their distress, number one, it was a self-inflicted wound. Number two, it was a sovereignly imposed wound. It was sovereignly imposed. Now, here's what the prophet Jeremiah in the book of Lamentation says about God's people and their sin. About the condition of the people, about the mess that the people of God were in. He had predicted it himself, Jeremiah. God had sent him to warn the people of God to turn away from their sins and to turn to God. It was Jeremiah who said, for the people of God has committed two evils. Number one, they have, they have forsaken the fountain of living waters and they have hewn for themselves broken cisterns that cannot hold any water. And in chapter 1 of Lamentation, he says about God's people, The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is bitter in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before her foes. So I want you to understand that it was a self-inflicted wound, but I want you to understand it was a God, a sovereignly inflicted wound. In other words, God says, because you have turned your backs upon me, I have declared my judgment against you. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 39 and verse 21, it says, I will display my glory among the nations. And all the nations will see the punishment I inflict and the hand that I lay on them. From that day forward, the people of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. And the nations will know that the people of Israel went into exile, here it is, for their sin because they were unfaithful to me. So I hid my face from them and handed them over to their enemies and they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanness and their offenses, and I hid my face from them. Ezekiel chapter 39. So what is happening there? The mess that God's people are in. It's because, it's because that God saw that they were unfaithful to him. And God is saying to him, to them, I have given you my laws. I have given you my commands. I have given you my precepts. And my commands and my precepts, they are for your good. God says, if you follow me, you will be blessed. God says, if you hearken unto me, your future will be bright. But over and over again, they turned their backs from following God. My friends, here today, we are in a very bad situation. You can see the rebellion against God. 
you can go back to many, many years and you have seen the moral decline in America. And I believe honestly that God is saying to us, it is time to turn back, it is time to repent, it is time to come back to me. But we have gone so far away from God. We have come to the point like Israel did. They came to the point where they said, I do not need God any longer. You will recall in the book of Deuteronomy, God had said to his people, if you follow me, I will bless you. God said to them, I lay before you today a blessing and a curse. And God says, all you have to do is to follow me, is to live your life according to my precepts, according to my guidelines. God said, if you follow me, then your life will be blessed. Even before they came to the promised land, God said to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God says, I am bringing you into a good land. I am bringing you into a land of abundance. I am bringing you into a land of milk and honey. But God says to them, I want to warn you to remember that when you get into that land, when you are prospering, when things are going well for you, remember that it is God who blessed you. Remember that it is God who provided for you. Remember that it is God that brought advancement to you. And God says to you, be careful lest you turn your back from following me. You see, so often when we need God, when we are broken, when we are in need, we call upon God, we cry out to God. And then prosperity comes our way and we get to the point where we are independent. Where somehow we have all that we need and the dangers of prosperity is that it allows us to become complacent and it, and it encourages people to turn their backs from following God. And truly that is what has happened in America today. We have become a prosperous nation and little by little we have said to God, we do not want you anymore, we do not need you anymore. And we have moved from being a nation that was morally strong, a nation that depended on its guidance, on the guidance of the word of God and the precepts of God and we have said, Lord, we do not need you anymore. And Israel came to the point where they said, we are okay, we are independent, we can live our lives without the influence of God and without the influence of the word of God and they turned to idolatry and what Nehemiah sees there, he says, look at the mess we are in and the reason why we are in this time of distress is because we have turned our backs on God. I look in society today and I look in the church today and I see life at a very low ebb. I see there is moral decline. I see there are so many distressing things happening and it all boils down to the fact that we have turned our backs on God. And God is saying, come, come. God is saying, turn from your wicked ways. God is saying, come back to me and be restored. And God in his mercy and his grace sent this man, Nehemiah, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that Jerusalem life could be restored and God's people could be restored and once again, the blessings of God would come pouring in on their lives. And in the rest of chapter 1, you will see Nehemiah cries out to God. He pours out his heart to God. And there begins to be a restoration. 
I want to ask you to join me again next week as we look at, we finish painting the picture of the mess that the children of Israel were in. But you begin to see how God in his grace and his mercy begins the process of restoration. The good news is God wants to restore America. The good news is God wants to restore his church. The good news is God wants to restore your family. The good news is God wants to restore your life. It's God who said in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will restore them. God in his grace promises to restore. I ask you today, would you turn from your wicked ways? Would you turn from your sin? Would you turn from your going away from God? And God is saying to you, my child, come, come, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the picture that is painted for us in the book of Nehemiah. Oh Lord, he gives us the bad news, but then comes the good news, the news of restoration. And I thank you, oh God, that the good news still avails for us today, oh God. The news that says, God says, I will restore, I will restore, I want to restore. I pray, oh God, you would restore this nation I pray, O oh God, you would restore your church. I pray, O oh God, you would restore the family. I pray, O oh God, you would restore our lives in the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. And I pray that God has spoken to your heart. I want to encourage you to join us next week. Um, this, is, this is a tremendous, uh, just a tremendous story of how God took a people that were in a mess and God restored them and God can restore you today. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.